So part three of this presentation is um, going one step further. We, we're going to take that concentration data um, and use it as a component to get to our emission data for these barns. Emission is not, a directly, emission is not directly measured. Um, simply put, emission is the product of our airflow multiplied by the concentration of air leaving the barn. So in this section, I'm going to cover how we measured airflow through these barns and the resulting emission estimations. Measuring airflow through any naturally ventilated building is, is challenging because your air inlets and your air outlets to these barns are con constantly changing with changing wind direction. Added to that, you have very large openings that you need to monitor. The method we used to measure the airspeeds through these barns was to measure the, the airspeed in the, in the south wall opening and in the north wall opening. And, um, measure the airspeed through those openings and multiply it by the corresponding opening area. So with the south wall, we um, take, this uh, take the airspeed measured at fixed height multiplied by the area and similarly at the north wall. The law of conservation of mass dictates that if, if our air density is constant through the barn, which um, it should be a fairly safe assumption with um, very similar temperatures throughout the barns, Theoretically, we only need to monitor one opening. If we monitor one opening, we would have the airflow through that barn. However, we did go ahead and measure the airspeed and the, the, the airflow through both the south wall opening and the north wall opening to, to evaluate this assumption. I have a few slides to demonstrate our airflow data uh, using one of the sites as an example. In this particular graph, the data shown in red is our airflow measurements through the south wall opening, and our data shown in blue is our airflow measurements through the north wall opening. As the, as the wind speed, uh, as our south wind increases, and that being a wind from the south to the north, as the wind increases, as the south wind increases, we see a corresponding increase in airflow, and this airflow is in is in the direction to the north, meaning our south wall acting as an inlet and our north wall acting as an outlet. With increasing air speed or, or wind speed around the barn, we see increasing airflow through the barn in the direction that we expect. When we have a north wind, wind blowing from the north to the south, we see a, um, our airflow also reverse direction. And we see that the relationship between our north and our south wall becomes a little bit more variable as well. So while our north and south wall airflows, they weren't a one-to-one -one match like we would, would ultimately hope, we do see a relationship that was more consistent with south wind conditions. And that's what we expected all along. Um, so we, we expect that our data, our airflow data, we have more confidence in our airflow data, I should say, when, when, when we did have south wind. Sorry. One other impact that we saw on this airflow through these barns was the position of the curtains in the north walls. With um, these curtains, these curtains were typically um, closed up a little bit more in the winter. Um, and this had, we saw a strong impact not only on the magnitude of airflow, which is uh, demonstrated in the y-axis here, but also in the agreement between the north and south walls. I considered closed curtain conditions less than uh, one and a half meters or about five feet, whereas open curtain conditions greater than that, that five foot mark. As the curtains were closed, this difference between the north and south wall openings um, increased considerably. So again, what this, uh, what this resulted in is, is more confidence in conditions when the wind was from the, uh, from the south to the north and with open curtain conditions. The data that I just showed was an example data from one site. If we look at the relationship between the north and the south walls for south wind conditions and open curtain conditions, with two of our barns, the airflow through that north wall was about 80 to 90% of what we measured through the south wall, which for naturally ventilated barns, that's, that's a pretty good agreement. When we look at our other two barns, that north wall was about 50 to uh, 50 to 60% of our airflow through the south wall. Not as strong, but 
there was a very strong agreement as evidenced by these R squared values um, for that relationship. So why, why this difference? Why, why did it vary anywhere from 50 to 90 percent um, agreement between these two wall openings? Well, we feel that the south wall is such a large opening and we had a very fixed measurement in one part of the opening. We do see with smoke tests that there is some backdraft happening towards the roof and, and perhaps towards the bottom of, to some extent of that opening that we really can't capture. So that air that is entering and backdrafting isn't collecting up, collecting any gas to, to remove. So we still feel that that north wall is our best measurement of airflow through these barns, our best measurement to use in our emission data calculations. So the data that I'm gonna, gonna show now, moving into the, the emission data, uh, is using airflow measured at the north wall. As we, so the airflow measurement was one of the, the challenges to getting to our, to our emission rates. With um, airflow was part of, the, part of the equation, and then we had the concentration, um, concentration difference. With airflow, with this particular example day that I'm showing, our airflow changed directions twice during that day. We had at first a north wind, then a period of a south wind, and then again a period of a north wind. As the wind changed direction, we do see that our concentrations that were measured at the north and south wall openings also reversed, um, reversed directions in terms of which one was, which one was higher than the other. So, what this uh, what this shows is that how we how we moved forward using our airflow data multiplied by a concentration difference, but we are limited with how much airflow data that we have for south wind conditions. Um, this particular day, for example only about 30% of the day would have matched our conditions. So I'm going to show daily mean emission rates, uh, but I'm only going to sh share those data for those days when we have greater than 75% of that day's data meeting our airflow conditions. This is a, a simplistic way of putting together the um, emission data. We are going to look to alternative methods for emission data calculation and reporting. Um, but uh, we won't be able to share that here in this pr presentation. As a result of our method of airflow calculation and emission rate calculation, does result in less reportable emission data. Also, um, we have uh, variable airflow conditions for our measurements, which results in variable emissions. And that, that also then translates um, or impacts our ability to tie these emission emission data back to temperature or other impacts. So our relationships with temperature aren't as clear with this particular type of data, and so I'm, I'm just going to be presenting average daily means. I also want to emphasize that because we are, um, we are focusing on, on data that was collected for open curtain conditions, that means that the temperature conditions for our data is going to be on the higher side, summer, spring, early fall conditions when the curtains of these barns were in that open position. So if you think back to that concentration data, as we saw increasing temperature for ammonia and hydrogen sulfide especially, we tended to see higher concentration data. So our reported emission data are going to be biased high for that reason. Our daily mean hydrogen sulfide emission rates are presented here in grams per day per head, and they ranged from anywhere around, well, right around zero, upwards of about 15 grams per day per head. On average, uh, the range was from 1 to 5.5 uh, grams per day per head. The bedded pack barns did show higher hydrogen sulfide emission rates, and we can tie that back to the, that influence or that concentration data differences that we saw between the bedded pack barns and the, and the scrape barns. But keep in mind that this data is going to be a biased high, and there is a limited number of daily means um, using this method of reporting. For ammonia, there we don't see as, as clear a distinction between manure management practices coming out of this data, and that again echoes our concentration data that we saw, where um, the relation, uh, the concentrations in the four barns that we monitored were, were quite similar. Again, we do see large ranges in the emission data, even for an individual site, ranging from uh, close to zero, upwards of 
of 100 part of 100 grams per day per head. Just to put this data in a bit of perspective, if we um, compare these emission results to uh, an emission factor, an emission factor is basically one value for emission for a, a particular type of system. If we compare, if we look at the emission factor for um, beef feedlots that was used in the 2005 EPA ammonia emission inventory, that emission factor was 35 grams per day per head. And, and our, our ammonia emissions, our average um, daily mean ammonia emissions, are in that particular range of 35 grams per day per head. But again, we have such a variation in daily means. We, we know that our airflow, in addition to temperature conditions and manure conditions, greatly influence that emission rate. And so we're, we're um, emphasizing the need for process-based models or modeling processes to take into consideration more of the factors that affect emission rather than relying on one single value. For methane, our, our data was limited for one of the PAC systems and, and quite limited for, for the second PAC system. So if we do look at the um, average daily mean emissions from our scrape systems, it was in the range of 28 to 55 grams per day per head. Again, very large ranges in those daily means based on the, the limited number of data that we had. So the conclusions from this part three, from part three of the study is that we have we saw strong relationships between the airflow through the north and south walls um, for these barns, and this relationship was the strongest for south wind and open curtain conditions. With it, and this then limited the amount of emission data that, that we reported in this using our, the particular method shown here. We, see, we saw a very large range in emission measurements because of the wide range in airflow conditions going through these barns in addition to temperature and manure management factors. So the key points that we want to leave you with from this presentation today are that there are manure and bedding management impacts on the gas and particulate matter concentrations and emissions from these barns. There are also impacts of temperature and animal activity over the course of a season and over the course of a day. The range and variability in management practices and, and then also the resulting emission data, this range and variability we feel really supports the need for continued investigation into, into models, process-based models in particular, that can help account for some of this variation and provide us with some um, better estimates for, for annual averages in particular. I do want to remind you of something Beth mentioned earlier. We are planning a Beast Facilities Conference, uh, which uh, will incorporate some of this data and also go into some more of the management factors related to facilities, beef cattle facilities. That will be November 21st, and it will be held in Sioux Falls, South Dakota at the Best Western Plus Ramcota Hotel. So please stay tuned for more details on this.